Hi guys. So today uh, we're talking about BISC, which is an exchange for trading Bitcoin. And so um, basically the problem that um, we have is that we want to trade um, cryptocurrency for fiat currency. So we want to buy, let's say, Bitcoin for dollars or sell dollars for Bitcoin. And there's kind of two ways of doing this right now. Uh, you can either set up your own miner and based on that, um, earn some cryptocurrency and then you have it. So you spend dollars to buy yourself a miner and then you get some crypto out of it. But, you know, that's a slow and unreliable process or well, maybe it is reliable because you can enter a mining pool and then, and then uh, kind of collect keys based on that, based on your participation. But um, it's not going to give you a lot of crypto right away. And maybe you have some dollars that you want to put into crypto to see it grow or not grow, as the case may be. So the way this problem is solved is through centralized exchanges. Okay? And so you would have an exchange such as, for example, Coinbase or um, Kraken. There's a whole bunch of them out there. And... Um, you would sort of log into this exchange, set up your own account, and pass in your identifying information, which is um, kind of the real problem in this, right? So um, these exchanges kind of live in particular jurisdictions, okay? So US, and then uh, the FCC can come in as it has and request uh, accounts for the different users, right? And so the the uh, exchanges need to abide by the laws of the countries in which they're in, which can be kind of tricky. So to set up an account with that exchange, you need to give them identifying information, your passport, potentially your driver's license, um, kind of some pretty hard identifier that then allows them to file a kind of tax report so that you, so that the IRS can make sure you do your taxes. Right. Um, so once you have your account, you can transfer in some fiat currency into your into your uh, exchange account, and then with that fiat currency, you can buy crypto and and put it into your account there. Now the problem with this is that if it's a centralized exchange, there are other types of decentralized exchanges, but in centralized exchanges, your crypto is actually not held in your own account; it's held by the exchange in some pool of money. And when you need to make a transfer, money your crypto goes out of that pool of money into someone else's account or into someone else's virtual account if both of the people are on the same exchange. The advantage of this of that is that it can be quite fast to do these types of transfers, but the disadvantage is that you don't actually control your crypto and then someone can hack into it and potentially steal that crypto as has happened with a bunch of exchanges. Probably the most famous one is Mt. Gox. All right, so because uh, the exchange holds the keys, the private keys to your Bitcoin account or to the Bitcoin accounts, someone can log in there and steal that information by transferring it out of the exchange into some account that they control. Um, the other problem with this is that centralized exchanges will keep uh, your information, your private, inform your, I guess, your identifying information and will also keep track of the different trades you make and the positions you have. Right? So if you're using crypto to hide your, uh, your monetary activity, exchanges don't really guarantee you the type of privacy because the data exists and you don't control it. So it's not that they automatically exchange it, but you, you, you can't have guarantees of protection. Right? Um, as an aside, you really shouldn't be using Bitcoin to buy illicit materials anyway because the accounts can be de-anonymized that kind of tracks to individual users. So for that, you might want to use uh, a more privacy preserving um, type of cryptocurrency. Okay, so what problem does BISC solve? Well, basically it tries to create an exchange where your information is uh, held private uh, and it does it by not having a centralized information holder. We'll kind of come back to that. It's not quite true in my opinion. And then they also provide a decentralized trading infrastructure 
and that all the code required to complete trades runs on end user machines and not some centralized sort of servers managed by BISC. All right. So how does BISC accomplish this? Um, let's say that Alice wants to buy some crypto, okay, and Bob is willing to, to sell it. So first Alice will issue a buy offer um, into a, a, a messaging network. Now this messaging network is managed by Tor. We talked about Tor, Tor already, but it's a, it's a way to basically send private information between parties. So um, Bob will actually receive an information from this messaging network. In fact, it, Bob will see all kinds of offers uh, from that centralized network and is then able to select the one to trade with Alice. Okay, so Bob selects uh, selects the offer from the centralized network and then sends it to Alice to, to confirm. There's a potential here for multiple Bobs to try to uh, complete the transaction with Alice and then Alice kind of can choose one of them to, to avoid race conditions. Okay, so once Alice selects Bob's offer, uh, Alice transfers a security deposit into the Bitcoin network. Um, so this is just in case to kind of prevent fraud in making Alice put some stake into the into the transfer, okay? Uh, some money that she can lose if she doesn't follow the protocol. So then once Bob sees that this security deposit has made it onto the Bitcoin network since that is publicly visible, Bob can then transfer the, the crypto that he's selling and his security deposit also onto the crypto network. All right, now the key to this is that is that Bob will use a two out of three signature. This is a pretty interesting construct and um, it's basically a way of creating accounts such that to release money from that account, you need two out of the three signatures, All right? So if, Bo if both Bob and Alice sign this transaction, well, then the money can be spent. Um, or if Bob signs the transaction and then the arbiter which is also a participant in this uh, signs the transaction, well, then money can be transferred to Alice, um, right? So uh, it's kind of a way of creating a signature in a way that you need two parties, two out of three parties to agree to, to, to do this. Um, so once the transaction has been deposited onto the crypto network, just um, it, it, sort of, it sort of sits there waiting for approval. Okay. At this point, Alice can see that the money has been put into escrow, so to speak. Um, and so when Bob sends Alice his banking information, Alice can then initiate a bank transfer to move the fiat currency into, into Bob's account. Now, this bank transfer will happen outside of BISC and it might, you know, you might need to kind of log out of BISC and enter transfer information into your I don't know, Citibank or whatever other banking account you have to transfer the money basically to initiate a wire transfer to Bob's account. Once Bob sees that this money has, has made it, which could take potentially a few days in, term, in case of it's like a international money transfer, right? Bob will sign this deposit. Okay? So money arrives at, at Bob's and Bob says, okay, I can sign this deposit to, to Alice. Then Alice can provide the other signature and now the money can be dispersed such that the security deposit or Bob's security deposit comes back to him, okay? Alice's security deposit comes back to her and the crypto is transferred into Alice's account. Um, so that's basically the process if everything goes well. Now, it's possible that things don't go well and that's where an arbiter needs to be involved. The arbiter is a user uh, that is involved in the BISC network. Basically, it's a person that donates, well, not donates, that uh, contributes their time to ensure that transactions go uh, follow the protocol. And um, the, there are transaction fees that um, get transferred to the arbiter with every transaction, whether or not it requires a resolution or not. So maybe I should have added that the buy offer here also includes a transaction fee. OK, 
Okay, and the transaction fee will go to the arbiter at the end of this at the end of this protocol. Okay, so if the transaction fails to complete, um, for example, Alice transferred the money to Bob using the banking system, but Bob didn't unlock the deposit. Alice can then contact the arbiter and say, "Hey, this is not working out as expected." Okay, so because Bob deposited the, the crypto with the two out of three signature, um, the third signature could be provided by the arbiter if arbiter decides, yep, Alice transferred the money into Bob's bank account um, and Bob is just not releasing the transaction here. In that case, the arbiter can provide this third signature instead of Bob and at this point money could be dispersed to Alice. So to make this determination, um, Arbiter needs to communicate also over the secure Tor network with Bob and Alice to figure out what has happened in that transaction. Now, when Bob accepts the transaction here, basically the selects, Bob selects the offer and then Alice uh, initiates the transaction by placing her security deposit that security deposit, that selection of the offer and security deposit also includes a contract. And the contract includes things like uh, money needs to be transferred into such and such uh, real account owned by Bob. Okay? So then the arbiter can see this information, can talk to Alice and talk to Bob to try to get uh, to see what actually happened. Has the money been transferred? Are the records of the money being transferred? Has Alice transferred the right, of the right amount of money? Right? The arbiter talks to the parties and, and decides what actually has happened and who's at fault and based on that releases the money that's been deposited onto the Bitcoin network to one party or the other. Okay, so it's kind of a manual process. Now, the question is does uh, BISC actually protect user privacy any better than centralized exchanges? I think this is kind of an open question. Um, the banking information is certainly sent to the other party. So now I'm not just trading Bitcoin with somebody else, I'm also exchanging my banking information with them. Um, that is some pretty significant amount of identifying information and yes I'm sending it maybe to just some party who has no interest in it as opposed to this information being kept by a centralized exchange, but who knows what Bob, who Bob really is, right? Um, divulging some pretty sensitive information that maybe I don't want uh, the other party to have. Um, right? The other problem is that if a transaction goes wrong and that can be forced really by either party, either by Alice by not sending enough money um, or by Bob kind of saying that money never got there, even, even though it did, uh, so either party can force an arbiter to get involved. Now the arbiter gets to see all this information as well. So there's a possibility for either party to disclose the other party's information to the arbiter. There's a possibility of collusion. Right? So even though these arbiters are kind of other users, um, it could also be that maybe the government starts serving as an arbiter to try to get access to all this, to all this information. So. I don't think it's really as well protected as they think it is. Um, but I think it's a step in the right direction, right? Maybe if they can kind of figure out, um, I don't know, how to protect privacy a little bit better or how to have something, some other payment method other than through banking, um, I think this could work a lot better. Um, now the examples I'm going through really just have to do with fiat currency. They also support trading between different cryptocurrencies where your information can be a little bit better protected. Some of the other problems that I see with the system is that they say that it solves the problem how to get your first, first Bitcoin, right? You have some money, you want to buy Bitcoin, how do you do it? Well, the difficulty with this approach is that you still, if you want to buy some Bitcoin, you still need to uh, save or send the security deposit, which is 0.1 Bitcoins. So how do you have that in the first place if you just want to buy Bitcoin, right? That's not really explained in the, in the paper. So I think it's good if you want to buy more Bitcoin, maybe, but it doesn't really help you get that first Bitcoin. 
and so they kind of fail at that in my opinion um, the the last problem with this as uh, someone who had to do a lot of bank transfers recently between us and norway when i was there on a sabbatical is that these bank transfers can actually take a significant amount of time and so if i want to buy crypto now and not next week when the transfer completes uh, this may actually be too slow of a mechanism right certainly if you want to do fast trading uh, centralized exchanges are are better for that so it's still kind of a uh, an open problem as to how to trade bitcoin if uh, <laughs> you want to do it quickly and if you want to do it privately right it's um, it, i don't think there's a good solution out there so for those types of things we can talk about other types of uh, cryptocurrencies such as monero and see how privacy can be protected in these types of systems all right thank you guys